the ominous spectre of civil unrest finally cast its shadow upon the gates of Rome. Once a distant woe in the empire's far reaches, it now demanded attention from those who governed the Eternal City. Maxentius, the self-proclaimed sovereign, could no longer dismiss the chilling reality. For six years, he had navigated the storm of civil discord, convinced of his imperial destiny. The intricate tetrarchic system unravelled with Emperor Diocletian's abdication, leaving rulers to perish in the ensuing power struggle. Amid this tumult, Maxentius clung to Rome, deeming it the ultimate prize. His ascendancy, however, relied not on personal prowess, but on the branches of his family tree. Through coercion and violence, he quelled the once resilient Senate, rendering it silent in exchange for the promised stability that Maxentius pledged to a war-weary Rome. During his rule, he sought to revitalise the city, stabilising trade, reinvigorating commerce and spearheading ambitious building projects. The Basilica of Maxentius, an emblem of grandeur in the Roman Forum, stood as a testament to his architectural aspirations. Maxentius aimed to embody the aristocratic old guard, staunchly upholding the ancient traditions of the Roman Empire and resisting new or foreign concepts. He vehemently opposed the burgeoning faith originating from Greece and the Jewish lands, whose followers rejected the pantheon of Roman gods, instead worshipping a single deity in human form, crucified and resurrected. Viewing these Christians as both weak and irreverent, they became a target for persecution, and Maxentius was resolute in eradicating their movement. As the drums of war sounded, Maxentius had to set aside his conservative reform plans. Valeria, his wife, distanced herself from political machinations, finding solace in the imperial palace gardens with other prominent Roman wives. Meanwhile, Maxentius's son, Romulus, received a privileged education. Although Maxentius occasionally pondered preparing his son for leadership, the intensifying civil strife compelled him to defer such plans. In the recent council meeting, Maxentius confronted the stark reality unfolding in Rome. Constantine, his Gaulish co-emperor and rival, marshalled forces to the north, presenting an immediate challenge. The council convened in the marble chambers of the imperial palace, with Maxentius at the centre of the deliberations. Constantine has set up camp and is plotting his next move, Your Excellency, reported a councillor with a grave demeanour. An attack is imminent. Rome, vast and sprawling, cannot endure a siege. We must face him in battle and... The councillor hesitated, punctuating the sentence with a dramatic pause. Well, what is it? Out with it. We haven't time for your theatrics, Maxentius demanded impatiently. Your army lacks discipline. Idle and purposeless, they indulge in revelry and debauchery. A soldier with a coin-filled purse is of no utility, continued the councillor, revealing the unsettling state of the imperial forces. In sombre silence, Maxentius absorbed the grim tidings. His handsomely paid soldiers, left unoccupied, stirred concern. The encroachment of Constantine with a sizable force added to the disquiet. Understanding the impossibility of holding vast Rome, Maxentius devised a strategy. To divert his idle soldiers from the allure of wine and harlots, Maxentius ordered them to move outside Rome and build fortifications along the Tiber, near the Milvian Bridge, the city's gateway. In this stratagem, he hoped to address the impending challenges on multiple fronts. In the ensuing days, the fortifications took shape, and Maxentius, driven by zeal, directed the efforts. More ramparts, deeper ditches, the palisades. I want them sturdy and defiant. Archers lining the riverbank like a formidable phalanx, he bellowed, gesturing frantically as he stood upon the bridge, surveying the realm that unfolded along the sinuous embrace of the Tiber. Fortify this bridge until it defies the very notion of crossing. The commanders, attentive, nodded in agreement before dispersing to carry out Maxentius's orders. Pleased with the progress, he left the growing fortifications, followed by his entourage of guards and close friends trailing behind. Opting for a horseback sojourn through the city, he steered towards the heart of his other grand endeavour, the Basilica of Maxentius, a journey traversing the city's periphery to its very core. Arriving at the Basilica's construction site, Maxentius halted, observing the bustling activity with satisfaction. Labourers toiled incessantly, transporting stone blocks, assembling colossal columns defining the monument. 
The facade, adorned with ornamental intricacies, depicted tales of Roman triumphs, mythological narratives, and imperial propaganda. In a fleeting interlude, Maxentius cast away the weight of his concerns, directing his attention to the entourage with a smug countenance. Extending his hand toward the emerging masterpiece, he proudly declared, This, my friends, is my magnum opus, the pulsating core of civic life in our capital. His companions responded with nods of concord, their collective gaze transfixed upon the unfolding grandeur of the monumental edifice. While traversing the city, Maxentius caught sight of the Temple District, a realm in Rome adorned with myriad shrines and sanctuaries. Contemplating the looming prospect of battle, he resolved to pay a visit to the Temple of Dioscuri, an abode intertwined with military triumphs and the welfare of the Roman state. The air within the sacred temple was dense with the earthy fragrances and the dance of flames cast haunting shadows upon the marble walls. A young priest, cloaked in a black robe, materialised from the shadows. Respectfully attentive, he listened to Maxentius's reasons for entering the sacred space. Upon the emperor's conclusion, the priest bowed, gesturing for Maxentius to venture deeper into the temple's recesses. Instructing his companions to await his return, Maxentius disappeared down the dim corridor. Through a dim passageway, Maxentius descended into a circular chamber with supporting columns and an ascending dome. Illuminated by flickering candles and the dome's aperture, the space housed wooden cages suspended with chirping birds. A medley of scents, incense, earthy herbs, bird droppings and blood filled the air. At the centre stood a sizeable bronze basin, its surface capturing rays of light. The floor, scattered with dried blood and feathers, bore witness to past rituals. Abruptly, a young woman emerged from the shadows, draped in a scant, tattered robe, her skin adorned with inked symbols. Her face hidden beneath wild, matte hair, she was the Haruspex. Seated by the bronze basin, she gestured for Maxentius to join, and he complied. The world is in turmoil, problems accumulating, Maxentius whispered to the Haruspex, leaning over the bronze basin. I'm not in control of the events right now. Troubles are piling up, and I'd like to see what I can do. This much I can tell you right now, uttered the Haruspex, raising her head upwards. The celestial bodies are in disarray. A great shift is happening. The world as we know it is coming to an end. What role you will play in this cosmic drama, I do not know. Another priest in black appeared, offering an ornate clay cup filled with a foul-smelling steaming liquid. Despite its repulsive odour, the Haruspex drank from the cup and extended it to Maxentius. He accepted the offering, taking a gulp of the bitter, earthy concoction. Passing the cup back, the Haruspex consumed the rest. The liquid's effects were peculiar. Maxentius began to feel restlessness, his palms sweating. The room's details sharpened, revealing intricate patterns moving across the walls like undulating waves, responding to the interplay of light. The mesmerising dance of matter might have captured his attention, if not for his female counterpart. In a spectral dance, the Haruspex chanted incantations, the cadence beyond Maxentius's comprehension. Abruptly halting her macabre ballet, she pointed the knife at a cage, and the vigilant priest swiftly presented a living bird. With a few additional incantations, she plunged the knife into the avian form, its lifeblood cascading into the bronze basin along with its lifeless corpus. Maxentius, momentarily divested of his imperial façade, observed the grotesque spectacle with a melange of trepidation and anticipation. The Haruspex, her gaze affixed to the gory canvas, manipulated the entrails and blood with her index finger. With deliberate strokes, she moved the crimson ichor, forming a horizontal line between herself and Maxentius. Thoughtfully, she intoned, The realm is cleaved in twain, north and south. You... In the south, another figure controls the north. Maxentius, the gears of cognition whirring with intrigue, connected the bloody line before him to the watery confines of the Tiber, an unseen boundary separating him from his rival Constantine. The Haruspex continued her macabre examination of the blood-filled basin. After further manipulations with her finger, she drew a second bloody line, intersecting the previous one and forming a symbol resembling a cross. The empire will be divided further, she intoned, east and west. 
the cross shall stand at its centre. Many will come to proclaim and uphold this new world. Impatiently, Maxentius demanded, Damn it, woman! How do I fit into all of this? Tell me about me. The Haruspex, engrossed in her examination of the avian entrails, fell silent for a few moments before offering an explanation. Your name is not written in bold letters. Maxentius, grappling with fate and divine will, implored, Can nothing be done? Gesturing toward the gruesome scene in the basin, he questioned the oracle. Does this reveal the future or potential paths? Nothing is set. Only the present exists, cryptically replied the oracle. To sit at the gods' table, sacrifice is required. Blood pays for blood. Emerging from the temple, Maxentius, entangled in confusion, left the haruspex to her chance. Back in the tangible world, answers proved elusive. His entourage, awaiting him, seemed relieved. However, the potion's effects intensified in the presence of people. Struggling onto his horse, the group cantered back to the imperial palace. Maxentius contemplated the oracle's words, Nothing is set. Gods require a sacrifice. Blood pays for blood. Maxentius, drained by the day, sought solace in wine upon returning to the palace. Longing for his family's presence, he stood in silence. After a few minutes, he summoned one of his lieutenants. How many Christians are there in the city? Not many, Your Excellency, perhaps a few hundred. But their numbers grow with each passing day, despite our attempts to outlaw their faith. Many have been imprisoned at your last request, explained the commander. Are they still languishing in the dungeons? Most certainly, Your Excellency. Maxentius detested the new religion for its disrespect to Roman gods. He tested Christians' faith in gladiatorial games, but halted due to civil strife, leaving many imprisoned. Go out and arrest anyone who has anything to do with Christianity, Maxentius proclaimed. Arrest anyone who even looks at a cross of any kind. Alone again, Maxentius longed for a tranquil Rome, free from internal strife and foreign influence. Despite his discontent, he envisioned the basilica's magnificence, contemplating its interior design over wine before succumbing to sleep. Days passed, and the fortifications outside the city by the Milvian Bridge were completed, restoring discipline among Maxentius's soldiers. To showcase the work, Maxentius brought his family, but Valeria's unimpressed demeanour revealed concerns about the impending battle. This is quite serious, Maxentius. I spoke to other wives. Constantine is a military man, she remarked with an air of anxiety. He is from Gaul, isn't he? That whole region is a little backward. Are you sure you're prepared? And what if you're defeated? My teacher told me about Gaul, chimed in Romulus. It's full of forest people who eat each other and dress in bearskins. Valeria gave her husband a stern look. This impromptu commentary from his young son did little to ease the tension. In an attempt to change the subject, Maxentius proposed a new plan. Would you care to join me in observing the progress of the Basilica? He suggested with excitement. Do you really expect us to join you in this cold weather to inspect your construction site? Valeria retorted. We prefer the warmth of the palace. The night before battle, drunk on burgundy wine, Maxentius dismissed all but his troubles. Burdened by chaos, he pondered an elusive empire, the weight of responsibility like a cumbersome regal robe. No simple solutions. Events spiralled beyond his control. Family eluded influence, the basilica incomplete, Rome slipping away. He was a stone thrown in midair, suspended. In his self-pity, he summoned his commander, who promptly appeared. Have all the Christians in Rome been arrested and imprisoned as I commanded? Maxentius inquired. Yes, Your Excellency, nearly a thousand, including those we imprisoned earlier. After a contemplative pause, he muttered, Feed them to the lions. The commander, slightly startled, hesitated for a second, processing the order before reluctantly nodding in acceptance of the emperor's command. Gods want a sacrifice? Maxentius asked himself. I'll bring them a sacrifice. Blood pays for blood. Almost as an afterthought, a way to regain some semblance of respect and control, he uttered, and get my armour ready and polished. I will be present at the battle tomorrow. 